the most important thing for organizations is to remember that the real transformation that's underway in, in CX or in digital transformation is about the human piece, the people piece. So it's about creating new ways of working in your organization that are customer first and digital first at the same time and employee first, right? We're seeing this big rise in employee experience focus because if you can't get the best employees to work for you to serve your customers, there's nothing you can do about your experience. Welcome to a whole new episode of Engadi CX. I'm your host, Jeremy D'Souza. And today we have a really amazing guest on the show with us. But before I introduce you guys to our guest, allow me to quickly introduce you to the magic of Engadi. Engadi is the world's leading multilingual no-code chatbot platform available across 14 channels with more than 35,000 bots created across 186 countries in every domain and use case. Engadi has also been recognized as a top platform by Inc.com, TechWorld, CIO, and many others. We run the Engadi blog, the video channel, and the Engadi CX podcast, receiving upwards of 400,000 visitors annually. And now for our fantastic guest. Graham Clark is a digital first, but not digital only, multi-channel customer experience transformation practitioner and leader. He has led organizations ranging from startups to SMEs to even Fortune 100 divisions. He specializes in transformational solutions that deliver measurable outcomes based on deep customer understanding and insights, analytics, and digitally enabled operating models. He has a unique approach to CX as he integrates business strategy, operations, analytics, digital experience, and infrastructure to deliver multi-channel customer, employee, and partner focus emotionally effective or engaging experiences. Graham, we're really, really thrilled to have you on the show with us today. It's great to be here. Okay, Graham, um, my first question to you is, what do you mean by a digital first, but not digital only approach to customer experience? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I mean, to kind of flesh that out, it's more precisely digital first, but not digital only multi-channel. So it's a term that I invented about six or seven years ago to describe what we saw as the experience expectations of people, right? So with a you know, digital revolution over the last 20 years of websites and then mobile and then social and then all the other components, um, you know, increasingly, no matter what demographic, in what country, in what particular business scenario, you know, customers are moving to go to wanting their experiences digital first. Um, and then, but it's really important for businesses to recognize that it's not always digital. I mean, you think about, you know, when something goes wrong on the website, who do you call, right? You think about the revolutionary leaders of the digital movement like Amazon. Well, Amazon's not digital only because they have to deliver things to your door. Um, so, you know, we, we see customers increasingly thinking about this as a truly multi-channel experience. And while there are occasions when people are actually non-digital first, organizations have to really think about the whole spectrum of channels and the whole spectrum of interactions in order to be successful with their customers. By the way, we have a, another term that customer experience professionals hear voices. So you have voice of the business. What does the business think the customers want? Voice of the customer. What does the customer say they want? But then voice of analytics, which is what do your digital platforms tell you by monitoring the behavior of those customers, analyzing their voice conversations, analyzing their emails, their social media streams, and all those things together allow you to truly understand what it is that your customers or in fact, your employees or your suppliers or your partners or regulators and all the other audiences really want and need. Yeah, that's definitely going to give you a much deeper understanding of what they want rather than just what they say mm -hmm. they actually want. Mm -hmm. Graham, my next question to you is, do you believe that customer centricity and digital transformation go hand in hand? Or do you believe companies can get lost in the current hype of digital transformation? Simplistically, the answer is, Yes, to both of those questions, but not always. So, um, you know, customer centricity and digital transformation, clearly in a world of digital first or increasingly digital first, um, they're critically important because if your customers want digital first, then you not only have to provide that to them, but you also have to ensure that your organization and your operating model are realigned 
to really kind of balance these digital and non-digital capabilities. Having said that, you talked about the hype of digital transformation, right? So I've been in the business world for 35 years, and there's a tremendous tendency for organizations to get completely obsessed with the sparkly new ball of digital technology or other technologies. And while they're critically important, especially as we see the digital world evolving with intelligent experiences driven by uh, chatbots, driven by personalized and modified experiences with AI and machine learning and virtual reality and smart devices like Alexa and environmental monitoring like Google Nest. Um, you know, there's so many different digital technologies out there and it's very tempting to say, if I just go and buy X, my entire business will be, will be fine. So we see these two movements, experience centricity, customer centricity, and digital transformation as being hand in hand to not only the prosperity of organizations today and tomorrow, but the survival of those organizations. So um, yes, there's a lot of hype. There's actually a lot of hype around customer experience and customer centricity too. Um, and they're really, really important. But as long as organizations uh, think about these, these things and act on these things in a holistic manner, um, you know, we think they're both really important things for senior executives to, to get obsessed about and to focus on and to invest in. So um, what I'm understanding is that instead of just looking at the shiny new bit of technology that's coming in, um, look at the voice of the customer, look at the voice of the analytics, see what they actually want, what would actually benefit them and go for that technology rather than just chasing every new thing that comes out. Am I right? Yeah. And, 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 and in addition to that, you know, be careful about buzzwording, right? Another trendy um, word that people are very addicted to is the word agile, right? Which is, which is can get overhyped, but is really important. So with many, especially many of the new technologies, I mean, I talked about, you know, environmental sensing, um, intelligent experiences, chatbots and other things, you know, we're all learning, including the customers, about precisely what do these do and how important are they. So for most organizations, you know, make a move, try some stuff, monitor what people are actually looking for, and then continuously evolve how you're using the capabilities, the digital capabilities, to truly impact the customer experience. And of course, the only person who can actually tell you how they're reacting to the customer experience is the customer. So one of the most important capabilities to deploy alongside many of these new technologies is a true voice of the customer capability that allows you to listen holistically across all your channels, analyze what you see, and then act, including modifying the digital capabilities to deliver. So it's, uh, there's really three things going on, right? Customer ex experience transformation, specifically CX or customer experience, digital transformation, and then this ability to create a truly agile way of working in this new digital first world absolutely that was really really interesting Graham, what do you think is missing per se in most companies cx plans and should cx strategies vary according to the industry or is there like a set formula which most of them would be following a big set of questions in those three points um Maybe I can kind of answer them in slightly different order. So the, the basic principles of, of CX, I think, are well established. So we're, we're arguably 20 years or so into the modern CX movement. I like to say that CX has two birthdays, like the Queen of England, um, 1968 or so, when a bunch of crazy uh, marketing folks from a company called JD Power created the customer satisfaction score for the automobile industry. And then around 2002, when we saw the big, voice of customer players in CX, you know, Satmetrics, Qualtrics, Medea, um, emerge into the marketplace. We saw some small consulting companies and, and over those 18, 19 years since then, we've seen kind of CX adopt. So, um, but I think most people understand that, you know, CX is based on a set of fundamental capabilities, the ability, as I said, to listen, analyze, and act on customer feedback, having a strategy that says, you know, you know which customers you're putting above other customers. I know that's horrific, but the reality is a business has to do that. You know, you understand your CX tech stack. Um, you have deep understanding of your customers, which is continuously evolving. You know, you're designing experiences intentionally and you're managing those experiences and so on. So there's, there's definitely a set formula in the sense of what you have to do, but that's a little bit like saying, you know, you've got woods, wood and brick to build a house. 
but you could end up with a tiny little house or you could end up with a mansion, right? So how do you apply them? Um, and that's where we get to see it. strategies vary by industry. So I think, you know, while there, while there's commonality, there's also differences in how you apply it within particular industries based on the expectation of customers. And there's obviously a differences between how you apply it in individual companies, which is another real question. So the biggest, I mean, one could argue the biggest differences are around business to consumer and business to business and obviously business to business to consumer, like an insurance company that's providing their product to, to consumers through agents or, or, a, or a consumer product company that's providing through retail stores or retail channels or online. Um, so there are, there are fundamental differences, but even those really pale into the idea that the one thing all of those organizations have is what they're dealing with is people. And so whether people are at work or people are at home as consumers, they're people and people have the same kind of psychology and the same needs. So I would say, yeah, there's differences, there's variations. There is a core set of principles that I think are commonly agreed with across the world and have evolved over the last 18, 20 years. I think what's missing in most companies' CX plans, um, I mean, overall, firstly, let's recognize that the CX movement, CX as a formal discipline with this set of agreed capabilities is really early. Um, you know, what we've seen is those classic early adopters have made big moves and they've shown huge benefits, but the vast majority of organizations are just starting to really kind of treat this in the way that says CX as a discipline is fundamentally important to the success of their organization, their revenue growth, their competitive positioning, their market capitalization, all the other things that company executives really focus on. And so... You know, they're really early. So we see lots of companies, if we say that the first thing that organizations have to do is they have to find a way to listen to their customers, analyze what they hear and act on it, both with immediate response and in terms of long-term uh, systematic improvement of their business. Many organizations are just starting to get on board with putting formal systems and formal technologies in place to do that. Um, and so, you know, that's probably, I would say that's 80% of companies are just beginning that movement or just beginning to formalize it. Or they might have been sending email surveys for the last few years. But what about monitoring their social media channels? What about, you know, analyzing their contact center calls? What about monitoring their retail stores and their environmentals in their offices to be able to tell what people are doing? So the capabilities are expanding dramatically. The leaders are continuing to lead because they were doing the other stuff earlier. And so, you know, that fundamental principle is there. And then, and then when you wrap up these other, you know, arguably anywhere between 10 and 50 kind of key CX capabilities, um, depending on what level of granularity, you know, there's different pieces missing from, from, from different companies. But of course, no company can do all of those things. So, so we would say, number one priority, and especially in this era of COVID, by the way, everybody's expectations are changing nobody knows what those expectations are changing to anybody who says they know by the way is a fool in my mind um and you should run away from them people have ideas but what people what organizations really have to do is connect with their customers listen to them understand how they're changing their expectations in this in this radical global uh thing that we're sitting in and then modify their business to go with it so i would say there's lots of different things missing number one we get asked the question all the time. There's a whole list of things. What do we do first? Where do we invest? And the answer is if you don't have that listen, analyze, act process in place and the operating model behind it to transform your business based on what you hear, then you're ultimately going to fail. So I would say, you know, that's the biggest thing. And then when you, when you think about that and you think about how your experiences work with your customers, we also see that the the idea of a what I call a formal innovation plan around experience, which is, you know, looking at the kind of key innovations, which as we said is intelligent experiences, whether it's whether it's chatbots or it's you know robotic process automation underpinning those, plus you know the virtual reality, augmented reality, the environmentals, the speech interactions like the you know Alexa type boxes. There's a lot of innovation going on. They're coming fast, and so you need kind of a formal um, CX innovation plan that says you're going to, as I said earlier, in an agile fashion, I like to say play with some of those technologies. It's not, you know, games can be really critical, right? So that you have to evolve and figure out where those new innovations sit within your customers' demands, which of course, as you play with them, requires you to listen, analyze, and act 
on what it is you're hearing from your customers. So, you know, when we're asked the question about what's the most important thing, we have a really simplistic answer. We're not confused um, about all the different things and they're different by company, they're different by industry, they're different by country, they're different by market, different by product, as we kind of mentioned earlier, but, but you really have to kind of start with that basic principle. Yep. So there's this base underlying principle of, you know, that you have to understand your customers and then you build upon it depending on your industry, your company, every, all the other variables that come into play over there. And what I'm understanding from you at this point is that yes, CX is quite a young concept and the only ones who have really come far with it are maybe the Neophilics who started off with it really long ago. But there's lots of scope to grow, right? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, it's, you know, we, 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 we spend, we spend most of our time working with companies that have been around a while. Right. So, um, you know, it's always dangerous to talk about digital startups because Amazon was the digital startup just 30 years ago or 25 years ago. So, um, you know, organizations that built their business from the ground up in the digital world at whatever stage, you know, have somewhat of an advantage. However, organizations that maybe started 80, 90, hundred years ago, um, have the customers, right? Yeah. And they have the brand. And and one of the things that we didn't talk about that I won't go into detail is, you know, one of the things that really, um, really impacts this whole CX and even the digital movement is brand perception, right? There's a principle of customer experience. Customer experience doesn't exist in a company. It exists between the ears of the customer, right? And it's a perception thing. And so the way that your brand is perceived in the marketplace directly affects the expectations of your customers and how you adopt even some of these new digital technologies, right? Everybody recognizes that Amazon, you know, Google, Facebook, these are all kind of digital first, innovative, moving forward companies. There are more established companies that have the same reputation in the marketplace. Um, so you have to, it's really a question of kind of managing and understanding um, you know, that relationship between you and your customers and what they need and want. And that's also impacted, as I mentioned with COVID, by what's going on in their lives. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's actually a really complicated thing. I mean, we, we, you know, we live in this every day, but we have a lot of uh, empathy, I think, with, with business executives who are, who are just sitting there faced with this torrent of new digital technologies and changing expectations and competitors entering their marketplace. You know, one of our standard comments, we do executive briefings and interviews, and we're always like, if Amazon's not in your marketplace today, what date do you think they're coming? Because they're coming. And so, or the Amazon lookalikes. And so it's, you know, it's a really, it's a really hard thing for organizations to figure out, you know, what to do first, what to do second, what's the most important. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly uh, exciting, but not, simple movement that we're seeing when you combine these two experience and digital transformation revolutions. They really are revolutions that are occurring. Absolutely. That makes a whole lot of sense. Um, Graham, do you think that uh, with the increase in the adoption of chatbots, we're entering an era of self-service? Do you think that's a particularly good thing or could that have negative ramifications? Both. Um, I mean, ultimately, when done well, it's phenomenal, right? I mean, we think about, um, you know, the evolution of self-service, right? I mean, you think about uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when I entered the business world in the 1980s in the UK, um, you know, companies were were benevolently bestowing IVRs on their customers. You lucky people, press one for this, press two for this, press three for this. Some people did it really well and other people you had to go through 17 layers in order to get where you want and people gave up. Um, so, you know, when you look at, when you look at the era of self-service, it's been going on for, you know, a long time. Um, like anything else, some companies, some organizations do it really well. Some organizations don't. Most organizations do it semi-well and hopefully get better. Um, with chatbots, however, we think there's a fundamental difference. So I have been in the in the chatbot arena since uh, 2011, um, when I had a relationship with a one of the one of the earliest uh, chatbot companies, and we uh, we 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 implemented a chatbot for a, a an airline in Asia, 
Um, and, and then from there on, I got to be involved in some of the earliest robo advisors in the mid 2000s and so on. So, um, you know, chatbots are, are an incredibly engaging, potentially empathetic technology solution, which when applied in the context of all the other things that your customers want and need in the era of self-service, allow customers to do what they really, really want. There's a, a rule that's, you know, there's the three E's of experience and their ease, effectiveness, and emotional empathy. So self-service and chatbots can really elevate the ease and effectiveness when they're done well. And for certain customers, they can even be more empathetic. One of the things that we did back then six, seven, eight years ago is something as simplistic as saying, you know, maybe when you launch a chatbot, you can, you can launch that chatbot with um, 40 different languages, right? Well, if you have a call center and somebody's calling into your call center and you're a global company, how on earth do you staff for 40 different languages? So maybe a chatbot allows you to do that. Maybe the chatbot allows you to instantaneously answer the question, whereas they would be on hold calling a call center or standing in a, in a branch. So, um, and, then, and then one of the things we're seeing, which we see is really exciting, and we first saw about five or six years ago in some work we we're doing, is this idea of how the dialogue and the interaction is constructed with the chatbot and how the chatbot itself continuously learns to interact with better customers, you know, can, can really elevate emotional empathy. Again, it's all about, um, the way we see it is not about, are chatbots good? Is self-service good? It's what, how does it work in comparison to other options, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, really well implemented chatbots. And again, if we're, if we're in the early stage of CX, we're really at the tip of the spear in these intelligent interactive experiences. I mean, you think about, you know, speech as an interaction with the, with the you know, speech devices like the Alexas. But, you know, if you implement chatbots really well, you can do things that you just cannot do economically with a regular business model of people. And I'll give you a simplistic statistic that came out of that, uh, out of that initial project that we did 10, 11 years ago. I won't, won't go into names because I get in trouble, but um, you know, the, the chat bot that they deployed within two years answered 70 to 80% of all their social media based inquiries. So Twitter, Facebook, you know, all the social media channels and also about 50 to 60% of their emails, which actually paid for itself within like three months because their business was growing and it meant that they could, they could reduce their need to hire additional contact center agents and more importantly, have their contact center agents and even many of their in-person people focus on those really deep and meaningful experience elements that only people, human beings can deliver. So, you know, when you look at this, you know, when you look at this kind of emergence and you look at the idea of self-service and you look at the idea of, is it a good or a bad thing? We say, number one is intelligent experiences are better than non-intelligent experiences because they can continuously modify. Badly implemented intelligent experiences are horrific and terrible. Self-service is horrific when it's done wrong, but when it's done right, when it's done thinking of the customer first and when it's done in a way that continuously evolves based on what they learn about that interaction, you know, it is a fundamental and phenomenal transformation to the way that, that customers and employees engage with the organizations that serve them and with the ability of those organizations to both survive and thrive in their, in their markets. Yeah, I totally agree that when it's done well, it can be amazing. Um, to your point that yes, um, if it's a global call center, you cannot economically scale it up to handle like 40 different languages um, with humans. Um, and yes, uh, with Engadi, we actually allow you to build bots and deploy them in 54 different languages, um, adding to your point about uh, the complexity. Yes, mm -hmm. chatbots can handle around 80% of your simple queries and then you pass on the remaining 20 to a live agent and that gets done pretty quick. So if you have maybe chatbots integrated with like a live chat module, that could be probably really, really good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we think we see it as phenomenal. I mean, we see it as, as again, when done well. I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's it's the interesting thing about what we're in is 
it's, it's great because we don't just do it for a business. We live it every day, right? I mean, I do online banking, I do this, I do that. And, uh, and so we see, you know, to the point you focused in on, one of the things that's changing and that this is really important for is that people, you know, regu regular folk, right? They're, they're increasingly demanding these hyper personalized experiences without even realizing that's what they're demanding. You know, whether it's as simplistic as a chatbot or a, a, an interactive speech engine using their name, whether it's you know, people complain about my data is being stored and it's being used for nefarious purposes, while at the same time demanding that the experiences they get are highly personalized, which means they have to be based on historic data that's stored and used for. So, um, you know, we, 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 for, firstly and most importantly, we see this as an inexorable move, right? It's almost like whether you agree or disagree with the rise of intelligent experiences as a business executive is a moot point. The reality is you have got absolutely no choice but to start figuring out how these platforms work in your particular business environment. And again, back to the agile comment, it's a question of trying some stuff, measuring, modifying, listening, acting, and, and evolving how you use these capabilities to really transform the experiences of your customers and thereby transform your operating success as an organization. Absolutely. Um You've had some really, really brilliant insights over here. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? I mean, probably the most, the most significant thing that we see, I mean, we talked about, you know, some of these capabilities and we have a, you know, a lot more information of that stuff on our various websites because we have a group of companies that we all kind of work together. Um, I would say, I would say the, the most important thing for organizations is to remember that the real transformation that's underway in, in CX or in digital transformation is about the human piece, the people piece. So it's about creating new ways of working in your organization that are customer first and digital first at the same time and employee first, right? We're seeing this big rise in employee experience focus because if you can't get the best employees to work for you to serve your customers, there's nothing you can do about your experience even if they're designing your chatbot and modifying your chatbot. So, you know, we would say, remember that the real success factor is, is, is about the human piece. So putting the capabilities in place, putting the discipline in place around customer experience, putting the digital capabilities in place, innovating with things like intelligent experiences and chatbots are absolute basic table stakes. What's really going to make the difference is organizations seeking to deeply understand how their customers think, equipping their employees with the skills and the confidence to move into this new world, which is not only a transformational world for the customer, but it's a transformational world for the way businesses operate. And remember, again, most of our clients have been around 50, 60, 70, 80 years. The executive team learned most of what they know in business 25 years ago because they're all in their 50s and 60s. Um, you know, they're not like a Silicon Valley or Bangalore or Singapore startup, right? These are real businesses with real customer bases. So, you know, remember that the most important piece is how do you change the culture of your business and how do you both understand and even potentially impact the culture of your customer and the way that both your customer and your businesses and your partners and your suppliers actually behave and think about it. And so there's, there's a lot of psychology um, and what's, you know, we, we hear a lot about demographics, but there's this thing of psychographics. How do people work that's really involved in being successful? And then, and then we in these briefings, we always close with this, right? So there's a lot of stuff. It's a huge amount of things to figure out. It's completely overwhelming for many people about, you know, so many different customer segments and so many different opportunities and so many digital technologies. Our number one thing we say is do something, right? Just you've got to do something and it's better to of a thousand things that you could do, find three things that you should do and focus in on those things and figure out how they impact you and then understand what the next three are and the next three and the next three. But the, the change companies are not in charge of this change. Customers are in charge of this change and employees are in charge of this change and customers have to both respond and find a way to at least keep up if they can't lead because you know who really wants to step up and say we're going to be better than amazon over the next five years because you know they've had 25 30 years of leadership so we would say do something 
you know, start working on this stuff, invest in it, focus on it, but really remember that what you're really dealing with here is people and thinking of people as people and individual people, I think is a big transformation in the way that organizations operate today versus the way they operated, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Some really brilliant insights, Graham. Yes, um, companies do need to start somewhere. You can't just sit around getting overwhelmed by the million choices you have. Mm -hmm. Pick three, start off with it, keep growing, keep improving as you go. Graham, where can people reach out to you? So, uh, so at my LinkedIn profile, um, Graham Clark, uh, my, my core company is Customer Results. Um, I am also, uh, through that organization, a principal at a company called M Corp CX. Um, so Customer Results is www.customerresults, or one word, two hours in the middle, dot com. Um, my email, graham at customerresults.com. Um, as I said, M Corp CX is one of the global leaders and has been for 20 years in helping organizations step up to this uh, customer experience revolution. That's mcorp.cx. Um, and then I'm also a principal in a new startup called uh, Gestalt, which is focused on this digital way of working and this cultural transformation in organizations um, and go to that website and you can you can contact me there or my twitter handle is at g clark 2712 um and as i said you know a lot of people connect with me through linkedin so it's always great and and, and my philosophy by the way is to help and my partners the same way is you know we generally find that the smarter our customers and connections get the better we do um and we believe that this digital customer experience transformation is truly a revolution. And so we also believe in the rising tide raises all boats. So if we help people to be successful, it's really nice if they have us help them and pay us to do that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if they become more successful, then we all benefit as customers there out in the outside world. And, and as I said, you know, the better, the better our connections and our community does, strangely enough, the better we do. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's really our fundamental philosophy. Okay, guys, that was Graham Clark for you. Reach out to him. He has some really amazing insights and he's really got a lot of potential to help you out, help your business grow and succeed. Ingadi CX will be back with a new episode and a new expert really soon. So stay tuned and subscribe so you don't miss out on it at all. We'll see you around for the next one, guys.